Welcome to God Talk from Chaplaincy at CCCU. Today we welcome Anthea Mitchell, an ordinand in the Canterbury Diocese. Joined by Anthea Mitchell. Um, Anthea is an ordinand in the Maidstown area. So, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, Anthea? Oh, right, let's see. Um, I was born in Canterbury, actually. Uh, so kind of going full circle here, uh, to immigrant parents. My parents were Greek Cypriots. And as such, uh, I was brought up in the Greek Orthodox tradition, at least at home. Um, my parents also sent me to a Catholic um, school, a convent. Uh, just I think I think the intention was to confuse me as much as possible, really. But anyway, um, but in both of those places, I was, I was a very precocious child, obviously. What I noticed was that uh, nothing could happen church-wise, service-wise, without uh, a middle-aged man, you know, being involved. Um, certainly women couldn't really participate in any way. And, and it infuriated me, even as a young child, like the injustice, you know, really got to me. Um, and the desire to be a priest was kind of born at that point for the wrong reasons just because I was being difficult I think more than for any other you know deeply religious reason um <clears throat> but at the time because I'm nearly 100 years old at the time women were not uh, able to be ordained um so I just went through my normal school career uh, you know grammar school O levels A levels uh, went to university uh, actually to study philosophy and theology uh, and still when I graduated in 1988, 89 because I did an MA, um, still women couldn't be ordained so I kind of shelled any of those thoughts and joined the family business. My 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 dad was a hairdresser and um, and actually when I left uni uh, we were in the middle of a of a of a huge recession and getting a, a proper job wasn't an easy thing so I just thought well I'll, you know I've got some debts and whatnot I'll um I'll go back home and I'll work for the family firm for a little while until such times as the economy recovers and I can get myself you know a nice proper posh job and um and that never happened and I think the reason it never happened was because I kind of decided that um you know I really liked what I was doing I completely shelved the whole idea of being a priest um, and I put my head down and I worked really, really hard for years and years and years, um, occasionally going to church, not ever really finding anywhere that I felt at home. Um, I, I knew I didn't want to go to Greek church. Uh, I knew I wasn't by nature a Catholic. Um, I explored the Anglican church, but again, never really found anywhere that I felt at home um, until one day um, a client came in and she's one of these clients who um, came to the salon quite regularly but would never see a, a single person she'd hop around from one person to another so I hadn't actually had her in my chair for a while to talk to uh, so we caught up again you know, what are you doing? What are you up to? And she said, oh, actually, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a, a curate, I think she was at the time. And uh, and I was fascinated by this and, 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 and wouldn't let her leave <laughs> until she told me all about it and how it had happened and, you know, what she was doing now and everything else. Uh, so obviously there must have been something still there burning away, you know, uh, inside of me. And she said, well, why don't you come to my church? and uh, and see what it's like so uh so obviously i hadn't listened to what she'd said properly because the the following week i pitched up at the wrong church and um uh and i didn't see her there and i don't, <laughs> really didn't enjoy it either i won't tell you where it was um and thought oh that's a disappointment i thought you know i don't know i was expecting something different um when she came in for her next haircut uh, she put me right. I, I said I went to your church, and she said, "Oh, I didn't see you." 
And I said, oh, well, I went to such and such a church. And she went, no, I'm, no, no, that's not where I am. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm somewhere else. So eventually I got it right and I ended up at the right church. And the rest is history, really. I just felt, I felt immediately at home there. Um, so I guess we're going back mm, about 10 or 11 years now. And um, yeah, uh, you know, my faith grew. I started doing more and more in the church until eventually one day the vicar uh, phoned me and said, oh, do you want to meet for a coffee? And I thought, oh, no, what have I done? I've obviously done something horribly wrong. Now and he's going to tell me off. Um, so we met up for a coffee and he sort of sat down and said, so, um, so, you know, how, how, how is God? <laughs> how is God with you? And I was like, I think he's all right. Have you heard any different? Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so basically that was the beginning of the conversation. You know, we've been having a chat about you and we think maybe you could something you ought to explore, you know, ordination and have you ever thought about it before and blah, blah, blah. And that's kind of how it started. It took me a long time to get through the discernment process. I clearly wasn't an obvious candidate. So it took me the best part of three years. Um, but I got there in the end. And here I am. So I'm training at St. Augustine's in um, in Westmoreland. And I'm in my third year of three. I'll shut up now. <laughs> No, I, I was just thinking, so, I mean, obviously, there's a very mixed theological background, because oh, for sure. there must be theological influences from growing up and being mixed in very mi different areas of the Greek church, the Catholic mm. church, and then now you're in the Anglican church. Mm. Um, so let's start off with the obvious one. How do you find that blend of theology? OK, when you come to write, obviously, essays at St. Augustine. <laughs> <laughs> so so starting with the Greek Orthodox Church. Um, I my first language was Greek or Cypriot, which is a you know, slightly odd version of Greek. Um, but obviously, I don't speak ancient Greek or biblical Greek or whatever. Um, and so certainly some, sometimes still now but certainly when I was a child um, the services were conducted in, in ancient Greek and therefore meant nothing to me at all absolutely nothing so or, or, or probably most people there actually to be honest so there was no theology to speak of all it was was bells and smells um, at, at theatre you know, everyone dressed up as time lords and prancing about. And, you know, it was, it was lovely from that point of view, visually really lovely. But there was no there's no theology there to battle. I didn't get anything. So that's kind of neutral. Um, again, I left my Catholic convent when I was, um, I don't know, maybe nine or ten, I think. So, again, too young to have developed or understood any strong theology. Um, by nature, uh, I, I'm a wishy-washy liberal, um, definitely down, you know, that sort of like liberal end of of, 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 of Anglicanism. And so actually, I don't really have any tensions there at all to speak of. So, yeah, um, so, it's kind of easy. So do you think that helps? Because the one bit you missed out is you're, you're training to be a pioneer minister yeah. so this isn't usually when we think of ordinance we think of people going into parish ministry sure. pioneer ministry is something different so perhaps do you want to explain what pioneer ministry is well yeah i mean i don't really know what pioneer ministry is because i didn't have a pioneer bat and i'm i don't actually for reasons that i don't understand count as a pioneer um but i I wonder if that's just more because the the church and the college didn't really ever understand what my ministry was, you know, when I first started college. But but the idea is this. So there's a there's a thing called a minister in secular employment. Well, there kind of is a thing called that. The church isn't really very happy about it. But um, and it means people who see their secular work as the main area of their ministry. 
So that means that whilst, of course, I will have Sunday duties to do, I'm not going to get away with that. I'm going to have to, you know, lead, preach, do all of that stuff. Um, or I won't give up my day job. Uh, and once ordained, hopefully, um, I'll wear my dog collar to work. Uh, and so I will be simultaneously a hairdresser and a priest. Um, and it's the thing is that I'm doing both things at the same time. It's sometimes a priest, sometimes a hairdresser. It's that I'm both at the same time. Um, because to me, the the secular I hate that sacred secular divide thing but the secular role is 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 where I'm it's where I am it's where I meet people it's where I get alongside them it's where I get to travel with them on the you know life's journey um and so to me that is where I am best placed it's where it feels right for me to be um and parish ministry doesn't feel like the right place to me so yeah that's that's my version of it i'm sure there are others so I, i'm intrigued how this see i guess that you've almost built a congregation that you have people not only because you're a good hairdresser but because also you're a good listener yeah and you're offering spiritual comfort or spiritual guidance at the same time so in the same way that we might look at a church and we say, oh, yeah, well, you know, Mrs. Jones sits in this chair and Mr. Smith sits in that chair and the family sits in that chair. Do you have people that come to you on a regular basis? So third Thursday of the month is that, you oh, know, absolutely. Mrs. Smith comes <laughs> because she wants to do her Bible study and it takes her three weeks to read the next chapter of Mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very like that. I mean, obviously not with everybody and you'll you'll touch everybody in a slightly different way. Um, but yeah, for sure, some of my clients don't want to talk about it at all. Absolutely fine. Not a problem. Um, but and it goes, it, it, you know, so it's a huge spectrum. And some of them, as you quite rightly say, the first thing that that they will ask me when they sit down is, Oh, are you preaching this weekend? What are you preaching about? You know, what you know, what passage is it? What's your angle? How are you, you know, where are you going with it? You know, so yeah, it's it's huge. Um sometimes, um, as you say, it's just about listening. Uh sometimes and where it's appropriate, it's about maybe helping people to see where God is already active in their lives. Um, and sometimes it's it's not even that. It it it's just and particularly with a dog collar on, it will be, you know, a tangible sign of the loving presence of, of God. And I think that's a great thing in, a, in an environment where goodness only knows you're not expecting to bump into God. Um, and there's something about that, that tension, that juxtaposition that, you know, I think is, is, is interesting and worth exploring. I want to come back to that juxtaposition in a minute because there is, um, yeah, there, there is a certain vanity in haircuts and meeting God and and all, the, and that's very complex. So, at the moment, obviously, you're at St Augustine's, you're training. How complex has it been to run the minute, run your hairdressers, <laughs> run your training? and do as i know all your church commitments and yes. everything else um i think that i have to make a confession here that is that um I, the concept of sabbath whilst it sounds really lovely to me doesn't really ever happen at the moment um i am i am constantly doing as you say, one of those three things. I'm either standing behind a chair doing somebody's hair or I'm sitting in front of this Mac, you know, writing an essay um, or I'm in church doing something. Um, it's It's been a really difficult, looking forward to it ending, despite the fact that I've loved it in lots of ways. Um, I think that um, I'm enormously lucky because my family have been very patient and very supportive. I haven't been very nice to live with. 
um, for the last few years. I just hope, I suppose I hope that once this this academic year comes to an end and I move into a part-time curacy role, that it'll just get easier. I hope it will get easier um, because you won't have anywhere near the amount of studying to do uh, as you do now. Um, so, yeah, I, I kind of hope for better things. And I, and I, you know, I hope that in the time to come, I can get a bit more balance um, and stop ignoring that particular commandment, uh, as, as many of us do, I think. So I mean, obviously you've raised an amazing challenge there is is work life balance and that's that's something everyone and I think especially in 2020 in this COVID season that has become more. I mean, you know, I know a lot of people get up, they come downstairs, they've got their cup of coffee, their laptops are already running, they're looking at emails, and because we're at home, the laptops still going till 8, 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night. Um, so obviously there is this work-life balance. How do you think that will play out when you go into the part-time curacy role? Because then there will be pastoral demands probably that would take over from the essay writing demands. Um. Yeah, I, I, I possibly I am being um, a little bit too optimistic. I, I'm well known for my Pollyanna type tendencies, but I think that it's okay. I think I think it's different to being a parish priest because I think when you're a parish priest, people think you're constantly available for this sort of thing. Um, there is there's a hesitancy, I think. When, when you've actually got a, 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 a job and you need that job and it pays your wages uh, and you don't live in a vicarage and all of those things. I think that um, other people are unlikely to place demands on me in that way. Now, whether I beat myself up or not is another matter. Uh, that's probably quite likely. Um, but I don't think it is quite the same as the stresses and strains that a parish priest would go through and I think the boundaries are just easier to establish as well. So you know staying with this I mean burnout we know burnout is quite common in parish priests we know that a lot of priests suffer burnout a lot of people in and I use the priest termly as in the priesthood of all believers so mm -hmm. anyone that's conducting or walking with people we know that burnout is quite a common thing do you find the church supportive in your ministry or do you find it almost a barrier you know a wall you have to climb over mm. i think from the point of view of burnout um at college they seem to talk about nothing else um i find it quite frustrating really i know it's it's probably a good thing that they make us aware of it, but I am a little bit sick of having, you know, uh, this conversation. And I'm a little bit sick of people telling us how difficult it's all going to be, you know. Um, and the, the co college are very good at, at making sure that we know exactly where to go, where to get help. Uh, to spot the early warning signs and all the rest of it. So actually, I think I think the church has, well, I don't know if the church has got the message, but certainly college have got the message about that. So I'm not overly worried about that. And I think that um, this is going to sound really, really mercenary, I know. <laughs> but, the, but the bottom line is, and, and, it's, and this has happened actually this month and next month, we're, we're now closed at work. We're closed until the 3rd of December at the earliest, which means that I have to spend this time doing college work, getting my assignments done so that I can go back to work in December and work seven days a week until Christmas Day. Which means that I'm not able to do anything at church. I'm just not able to do it. I have to work every single Sunday until I, you know, sort all my clients out and put some money back in the till. And I... And I feel quite able, actually, there's no conflict for me. I feel quite able to say to church, I'm sorry, guys, I, you can't put me on the rotor in December. It's not happening. 
you know, I have to put my business first. I have to pay my mortgage. You know, so that's what, it's kind of what I mean. I think it's easier for me, you know, because I can just say that. And, uh, you know, the church isn't paying my wages. I understand that. Um, and that's, you know, it's not that I want to abdicate any of my responsibilities or whatever. But, you know, I have a, I have a bigger responsibility um, to my team as well. You know, I have a team of 11, 12 people and I can't just walk out on them um, because the church needs me to do stuff. So this is a very different type of ministry. My priorities, I guess, are different. Yeah. So, I mean, the role you're describing as a businesswoman that runs a successful business mm. is perhaps also a role that we would look to for someone leading a ministry. So it's it's very similar thing. You know, I have to look after the pastoral needs of my, of my team. Yeah. I have to make sure that the building's functioning, that the, the, the cash flow is there and all the bits that we need to do what we we are doing is available. Yeah, that's exactly do, right. Do you see that as a conflict to what would be classed as a proper priest? <laughs> so, do you, do, 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 do you see? What I mean, I'm not I'm not trying to insult you at all, but I can I can see people going, "Oh, well, actually, you're just a hairdresser that puts on a fancy clothes occasionally on a Sunday." Uh, I don't I, I don't know why the people that I'm dealing with, be that my team or my clients, are less important than the people sitting in those pews. I don't see that at all. You know, uh, I have a responsibility to to everybody that I come across, but particularly my team and, and my clients. They're my primary responsibility, aren't they? And the priest's primary responsibility, I guess, you know, are, is to his or her congregation and parish. That's just the way that it is. I don't see it as a conflict. So th this is coming back to what we were talking about earlier. Then this is the your congregation. You still have a congregation. You still have a, a ministry and a congregation that you need to support. It's just presented in a slightly different way. You know, so at some point or other, we could have a really interesting conversation about church buildings and the need for church <laughs> buildings. Um, especially in light of covid you know worship online is it proper worship is it not proper worship and all the rest of it um what about the clients do you ever get pushback from clients do you ever get the client comes in and go oh you know i'm not going to come to you because you're going to try and bash me with a bible and you're going to try and stuff god down my throat or do you, well, so, do you so, not come across that no, so far, I mean, remembering that I'm not wearing a collar at the moment. So, so you know, in a year or so's time, I might answer this question differently. Um, but so far, not at all. The, if Sometimes people will say, oh, that's interesting, dear. Um, you know, I'm not into all that, all that sort of thing. And fine. And then you'll leave it at that. But actually, even those people, they may say that. And then they keep coming back to it, like scratching an itch. You know, they say they're not into it and they just they keep on asking me questions about it time after time. It is really interesting. Um, my um, my incumbent, as as was because we're now in interregnum, but he always used to say to me, you think you're going to wear that collar. You won't, because after the first couple of weeks, you'll get really fed up with the way that everybody's attitude towards you changes, particularly at work. I don't think he's right. Um, time will tell. I think partly I don't think he's right because, as you quite rightly say, the people that I see um, don't generally just wander in off the street. They're people that I know and have known for years, um, my clients. So I don't, I don't think that's going to be uh, a massive issue. I, I would be surprised if somebody rejected me on the strength of the collar. Um, but we'll have to wait and find out about that one, won't we? So it's almost it's almost like a church plant, isn't it? I mean, it's, you know, it is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm quite struck by the idea of, you know, the worker priest movement in France. Yeah. Um, so the Roman Catholic priests that would get jobs in factories because they just the, the two worlds of the tradition bound Catholic church and the ordinary worker never collided. Um, 
and at the end of the day you know they would they would set their elements out on their bench and you know and give people communion and stuff in the factories and you know I, mean, I don't know what the ins and outs of, of that are or canon law and all the rest of it I'm sure there's probably all sorts of reasons why I'm not allowed to do that but you know it, that's a kind of vision for me of how things could go um yeah come to you for a haircut and a bible study and <laughs> a, a bit of exegesis all at the same time <laughs> I mean, you, I mean, be serious because you foresee a client maybe sending you a passenger or going, Oh, yeah, I'm coming in to have my hair cut. I would really like to talk about, yeah, they already do that, they already do that, yeah. And sometimes they, they, you know, they catch me on the hoof and they ask me something, and I and I don't have the answer to everything, weirdly enough. So, uh, I, I, you know, I will say to them, Um, do you know what? That's a great question. Um, I'm going to go away and have a think about that and then I'll email you and, you know, we can have a chat about it. So, you know, that that happens quite a lot, actually. It's good. It really forces me to people have got great questions. It really forces me to go away and do the hard work of thinking what I'm going to say to them. Yeah. So do you think that people are more comfortable talking to you? I mean, this again, I know this is really hard because the, the point where you wear a collar at work is yet to come. I mean, I yeah. would even be flippant and suggest that maybe you should just wear a cassette for a few weeks <laughs> just to see what happens. <laughs> but, but that conversation, that point where you put a collar on and then you're there cutting hair, may or might not change things. That's the future and who, who knows on that one. Yeah. But do you think that some people come to you rather than a priest because they see you as more accessible? Oh, so, you know, that. For us, I mean, there's three of us here that are chaplains, and I sometimes I think that people approach us because we're more accessible than having to go to the vicarage or the manse or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, do you think that people treat you very much the same way that you're an easier door to push open for that conversation? I, th I think there's no doubt about that. Yeah, absolutely. People are much more comfortable to have that conversation. In, in that weird place um don't forget also with hairdressing especially now with wearing visors and masks and everything else um we're not facing people directly we're not allowed actually to have direct conversations um with people and we and, and for years we've been used to talking in a mirror and that separation it really really helps um, people bring up all sorts of really <laughs> difficult things. Um, it's so much easier. It's a bit like, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a teenage child, it's often easier to get them to talk to you if you go out for a drive and they're not looking at you directly or if you go for a walk and they're not face to face with you. I think that kind of dynamic, you know, really helps. But also, as you say, they haven't got to find out where the church is, you know, phone the vicar and then you know he or she are not they're not in or make an appointment all of that sort of stuff it's just so much easier and it's not just my clients actually um other people's clients you know will, will want to have a chat with me about something and it might be something to do with I don't know baptism of a baby you know uh they want to talk about that should they have their baby baptized what does it mean um you know what are the restrictions around who you can have as a godparent um, I mean, I've, you know, I've even, my first funeral actually was a client um, who very sadly uh, had cancer, knew she was dying and, and, and said to me while I was cutting her hair one day, you know, would you, would you take my funeral? Um, which I did. Um, I, I had another client actually, I don't know if this is, it's too morbid for this conversation, but um, she, again, she, young woman knew she was dying and said, you know, how you know how vain I am. She was a little bit vain, bless her. She said, um, when, I, when I'm dead, she said, will you come and sort my hair out, you know, for, for when people come and do the viewings? It's, it's, this is the first time anybody's ever asked me to do this in all my, you know, I'm, I'm 54 years old. No one's ever asked me this. Um, and I went, yeah, yeah, of course. Thinking, oh, my goodness, what's that going to be like? You know, but but I did it and I'm really glad I did it. I was, you know, really touched that she asked and I was delighted to perform that service for her you know odd and sad though it was so yeah I do so, think you find it easier so in a way the, the services you can offer as a priest I, I suppose in some ways go beyond because as you say you're used to walking with people on the journey and I know that plenty of priests and plenty of ordained people walk with people through cancer journeys and yeah. through 
chronic illness. But I should imagine there's something quite different about that conversation. It's about physically meeting up with someone, whereas coming to the hairdressers is just what we do. Yeah, exactly. It's just know. what we do. Um, well, of course, the other thing I do a lot of is um, I I see a lot of uh, people for I fit them for wigs and hair pieces and things like that. And and uh, a, a huge number of these people are going through chemo. That's why they have hair loss. So, again, to be able to 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 sort of join them, join in with them on that journey uh, and do something for them, which is. Um, for which they're profoundly grateful actually it just makes them feel so much better and you can make the experience as um, well as easy as possible I suppose and you can have those hard conversations with them as well uh, if they want if they want to do that they don't all want to do that but you know people are often pleased when they find out that I'm an ordinand um, they find that quite comforting and then they they know that they can say stuff to me that you perhaps wouldn't necessarily want to birds and a hairdresser with that you know didn't have that kind of that kind of background so do you find that perhaps being a hairdresser allows you a deeper level of intimacy yeah, with your clients and then when you bring your your priestly relationship into that in that there's something else another level mm. that you can offer so that's absolutely right and people often ask me to pray for them as well um which obviously I make sure that I do, um, but yeah, so it, it, it is, an, and, and the thing is that there, I've got clients that maybe I have seen, I've been seeing for the last 30 years, um, so that's already a really strong relationship, um, and the other thing about that, I think, is that often people have an image of a priest as a bit I don't know, a bit a bit of an odd person, not really in the world, kind of somebody who floats above, uh, who sets themselves apart. And, and to some extent, of course, that is that is true. Um, and and there's a there's, there comes a point where you kind of have to accept that as a priest, that that's part part of your function. But I think um, the fact that you're so approachable, that they have known you for such a long time, that they've seen you in this normal, normal context, um, I think is. I think it's a good thing and you know and it's not it's not for me to tell the church you know where they need to go and what they need to do um but but you know I kind of think it really helps people to see the church in a different light um to have people like me dotted about I, th I think it's an old-fashioned ministry as well isn't it in in regard as these days we don't have priests in parish for 10 15 20 30 years I mean that's that's right. That's yeah. something that went that you got your curacy, you got your first post and you stayed there till you died. I mean, that's long left the church. People tend to move around a lot more. And that may so, be a good thing, of course. But... Yeah, I mean, there are there are benefits mm. to some people and there are downsides to others. You know, it depends on how well the priest fits in and, and how the dynamics of that location changes. But I guess for you, you can build such longer term relationships with people yeah. um just before we wrap up by asking you where you see this going i'm going to go i want to put you on a spot here because i've asked everyone this question one of the things that really called me that you said is you're used to talking into a mirror you're used to conversations in a mirror and we're all having conversations in a mirror at the moment because yeah. we're all staring at a screen and not really getting yeah. lights back so what would your tip be for conversing to a screen and <laughs> dealing with it like a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Um, I think um, it, it's a bit like preaching. I think in a way, uh, I think what you what you don't want is distraction. Um, so for me i tend to, i try to wear fairly plain clothes and so that so that actually when i'm trying to have a conversation with somebody they're not focusing on great big dangly earrings or you know a, a really patterned blouse or something like that mm. uh, they're trying to keep everything quite neutral so that what really matters 
is 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 what you're saying or or in my case as well what I'm doing um I think you know is it I think it's a bit the same when you're preaching you know you get told this when you go to vicar school you know don't for goodness sake wear bright yellow dungarees um when you're preaching because that's all people will look at um which is a shame actually because it'd be quite nice to preach in bright yellow dungarees but um yeah so I think I think that kind of neutrality and really focus on focus on the dynamic on the relationship if you can so fun so to draw to a close you know talking about focusing on relationships so hopefully you will finish this academic year mm -hmm. do your curacy mm -hmm. you will be ordained and then where <laughs> you know uh, is, is, is that a question? I mean, is that even a question or is it, you know, actually I have a business plan and that is my central focus and therefore whatever my business plan is for the next 10, 15 years is where I see my ministry going. Yeah, I think the thing with hairdressing, I think, is that it's, it's not a young person's game, but I think there comes a point you can pro you probably have to give it up before you have to give up being a priest, I think. Um, it is very demanding on on a person physically, uh, as well as mentally, uh, and also it's very fashion focused. So I think I will do this probably until I'm sixty, another six years, um, and then. After that, I suspect things will change, but I don't know exactly how. And I'm certainly not a career priest, so <laughs> I'm not I'm not heading to be, you know, bishop or anything like that. Um, but possibly at that point, there might be a sort of you using the things that I will have learned over those years. There might be some sort of sideways move um, into some sort of. Um, I don't know, uh, education, missional type thing is what I guess what I'm hoping, really. Something like that might come up. I, I don't want to stop working at 60, but I think I probably will stop hairdressing at that point. Yeah. Well, it has been absolutely fascinating to talk to you, Anzia. Thank um, you. That's been a real insight. I know I've known you for a little while, but that's been a real insight and opened up a lot more conversations we've had in passing and giving them some depth yeah. and everything. So Thank you so much for asking me, it's great. I'll invite people to come forward with some questions. Um, try and avoid putting Nancy on the spot. She's already admitted she doesn't have all the answers. <laughs> she might get you via email at some later yeah, date. Exactly. I'll email you back. Yeah. yeah. Does someone have a question they'd like to put forward? I have a question. Um, Anthea, you yeah. say, so your father was a hairdresser and you kind of just got involved with the family business. Um, the salon that you now work at, where you're going to be wearing your dog collar when you get, um, when you finish off your vicar school, um, what did your salon like whenever you started there? Um, did they know you were a Christian and like, how do they all take it? Are they Christians? Uh, mostly not um hairdressers are generally quite a forgiving bunch really um they come in all different shapes and sizes and uh i don't think it really bothered anybody i i understand what you're asking because i think there is you know because i'm the boss all right so I think there is a different dynamic there. If you if you weren't, if you had an employer, then it might be a little bit tricky um, because they might not be very happy about you doing that. And that's a conversation, you know, that you would have to have. Um, and some of my fellow colleagues at college are going who feel the same way as me that they don't want to be parish priests and that, that and that god has already placed them where they are the most use i suppose um they're going to have more problems than i'm going to have um because they are uh, doctors lawyers judges ceo of a charity um lecturers etc and it may not be appropriate for them um 
in the same way as it is for me. Um, with my current team, uh, only only one of them is a, is a Christian, actually, apart from myself. And um, she's way more evangelical than me. She never shuts up about it. Um, uh, and there are times uh, when I find that a little bit awkward, actually. I sort of think, oh, yeah, maybe maybe that's not quite the right thing to have said or you know, um, I probably wouldn't have mentioned that to that person. So if anything, I'm probably more cautious, um, I would say, uh, you know, recognising that people don't necessarily, you know, want to have that conversation when they come in for a haircut. And it's certainly not my intention to ram it down people's throats, because actually, I can't think of anything worse. Um, and there's a and there's there's a power relationship there as well, uh, that you have to be aware of, because uh, I'm the one holding the scissors. Um, and also, I'm asking people to pay me money. <laughs> so, you know, I really have to be careful there that I that I find the right the right balance. Um, and in terms of the team, I I don't hesitate to uh, to tell them what I'm up to to um, you know to have discussions about uh, you know what what I'm speaking about this weekend in church or or whatever. That's fine. Um, but I again, I, I don't I don't I don't push it, as it were. Uh, just don't, I don't think that would be helpful. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, Thanks. it does. Thanks. Cool. Anthea, could you, could you say a bit more about this one you picked up on just now, which is the kind of potential conflict of interest? Mm -hmm. Because um, the people you you could be ministering to are first almost providing you with dosh yeah they are yeah. so they're they're a kind of source of you, you have a particular interest in them because you know you want them to keep coming you want them to to, <laughs> to be good clients <laughs> of course and, yeah. and to access your ministry via that route they may feel more comfortable in the chair but they've got to be willing to pay mm. to get access to you um so that's yes. quite Good those question. are those are kind of I put it quite pejoratively, yeah. just to sharpen up the question. But I'm really interested in that. You know how you you obviously must have thought this all through. Yeah. How do you how do you kind of reckon reconcile that? You know, our ministers are those who are prepared to come to my shop. <laughs> okay, that's a good question. Um, I, I think, I think maybe the first time I see somebody, that's what the relationship is. Uh, subsequent to that, um, I am available to them without funds <laughs> exchanging, as it were. Um, there's there's no reason why people can't, and they do email or text me or you know whatever. Um, so you know that's that's completely fine. But I'm also aware um, that you know I'm saying oh it's a really wide ministry and I meet all these people. That's not strictly true because I only meet the people that can afford to pay me sixty pounds to have a haircut. Actually. So there's going to there's a whole strata of society that I'm missing out, and I am aware of that. And I have to, I, you know, I need to find other ways to to reach those people. That you know, that is that is on my mind um, quite a lot. That I can't just sit back and expect every to me. That's just as bad as the parish priest, you know, standing behind the lectern expecting everyone to come to church. You know, I do need to be more creative in my thinking about how. How I reach people, so I think you know the work thing is is just is just one element of of, of how as a priest I need to engage with with people. And if I may, you may you may have covered this because um, my internet dropped out at one point. Um, but what what difference is ordination going to make <laughs> to the relationship between you and the person in the chair? Oh, that's an interesting. I get this one all the time. You see, I've got yeah, this, I this whole do. time going through discernment. <laughs> Why do you have to be a priest? Why can't you just be a Christian in the workplace? Um, okay, um, I'm sure you know. I don't need to tell you what what a person goes through uh, to get to ordination. That it is, you, you know, it has to be a calling. Um, and do I hate to use the word authority, but I'm going to use it. You know, there is something there about the 
fact that the church has kind of signed you off, as it were, that you've been through this process, you've done the hard work, you've done the learning, you've done the formation. No, we're not finished it because you will constantly, you know, that that process will continue. Um, but there is something about that. Um, and so I think that people people do understand that on a level I think people do understand that they understand that there's a difference between the person who wears the collar and the person who is a Christian at work um, but yeah it's a hard question to answer we get asked it quite a lot actually <laughs> those of us that want to do this sort of thing yeah okay you said they understand the difference what is the difference um <laughs> I think the difference is authority. Honestly, it's, it's not it's an ugly word, but I, I, I really think it's that authority and formation. Um, and I think that's kind of what I'm getting at when I talk about the, you know, the other the lady at work who's who's a who's a Christian, too. Um, there's no filter. Um, there's no filter about what comes out of her mouth. Uh, not that I'm suggesting there should be, but I don't think it would be appropriate for me to behave in those ways as a person with with a collar on. I think I have to think really carefully, you know, before I open my mouth and say things to people. Um, and I think there is a sense in which people understand the gravitas of that. Does that help? It is a hard question to answer. That's great. No, thank you. I think I'd like to take both of what AJ asked you and what Jeremy asked you there and put them into another question. So, I mean, obviously you have an ethos to your business. Your mm. your, your business is your life, mm. you know, and I know from other business owners that virtually all their life is invested in the business. There isn't a separation of one from the other. The point hopefully when you then you're ordained do you think the ethos of your business will have to change to come more along the line of any ethos change that you have wearing a collar i think the short answer is no actually um i don't think so i think there is a limit to how much you can change change things in a business like mine because you are constrained by uh, for example where you buy your products from you know I'd, I'd love it all to be free trade but it's just not possible you know um so i think we do as much as we can in that regard already um so no i don't propose that the ethics of the business will change. What I do think might be a bit different is, is me and my responses to things, um, I think will be somewhat constrained um, because I think I will feel the pressure of the collar, if you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. I think there are probably, to my shame now, ways that I behave, um, perhaps snapping at people or, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. which I can't promise not to do when I'm wearing a, a collar, but I think I will be perhaps more careful about that kind of thing. Um, I probably should be more careful now, if I'm honest. But that's the thing that I think might change is that I will, I will feel the pull of the collar, as it were, in my own relationships you know with people so almost um because i've often thought the collar you know the, that marvelous line pick up your cross and follow me and i've always thought that the collar is the cross mm -hmm. it, it, it's a very heavy burden to wear um i, I say that as someone that doesn't wear a collar is an ordained and isn't on that process but you know, I've always seen it as a very heavy burden to where it's almost a millstone around your neck. Yeah. 
but at the same time, it's also very liberating. I know certainly in our work context that for Jeremy and Dave, doors open via the collar that perhaps wouldn't open for myself and AJ. Mm -hmm. um, so there is almost a liberation in the collar. Having said that, having experienced, you know, priests being quite verbally abused for wearing a collar, there is also mm. a millstone on the collar. So is, is that what you're reflecting on there when you say yeah. the restraint, but also mm. the liberation to be able to? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I think, I think things change when you put it on and I think they change not just for the per for, for the person that you're dealing with but I think they change for you as well and and as you say in some ways that's great and it's liberating but in other ways it's a burden because you are now a visible representation of the church and Christ and you'd better not mess that up actually, <laughs> if you can possibly help it. Um, so that's that's different, you know, to 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 me now. Um, just perhaps just being a bit harsh with somebody or, or whatever, you know, uh, it's, it, I think it's a different thing. Yeah, it's a lot to um, a lot to think about there, isn't it? Because, it, you know, there's a lot. Is there any more questions? I'm conscious of the time. We're coming to the end of our period together. Does anyone have any more questions that they'd like to put forward to answer? No. Should we just unmute and show our appreciation for Anthea and then with your letter go on her way to write yet another essay, I should imagine. <laughs> so, Thank you very much for giving up your time, Anthea. Thank you for inviting me. Most appreciated. So let's show our appreciation. Thank you very much. Please join us again for God Talk when we will continue to look at what it means to have a lived faith.